Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen, and I thank you so much for listening. Uh, As always, go snag your free top 200 study guide. Uh, It's a big PDF, 31 pages. Uh, I really highlight my most important clinical pearls, things that show up on pharmacology exams as well as uh, board exams. Uh, and things you're you're actually going to see in real life. So again, just for uh, subscribing, simple email, uh, you can have that resource absolutely for free, and we let you know when we've got uh, updates and new content and new podcasts uh, available there. So again, reallifepharmacology.com, uh, go check that out. Okay, so the drug of the day today uh, is furosemide, and if you're an avid listener, you know I've, I've covered the loop diuretics in general, but wanted to get a little bit more detail out there specifically about uh, furosemide and that it is a, a loop diuretic uh, brand name that you're going to hear in practice is Lasix. Uh, you know, definitely many, many patients, uh, excuse me, many patients and uh, providers uh, will refer it uh, uh, by the brand name. Uh, mechanistically, uh, so being a loop diuretic, that gives you a hint that uh, the loop of Henle uh, is impacted. So ultimately, it inhibits sodium and chloride reabsorption uh, in the ascending loop of Henle, and that's in the, the nephron, of course. That's the uh, considered the functioning unit of the, the kidney. And ultimately, with the uh, that loss of, of solute or sodium and, and chloride, water is going to go with it. And that's ultimately what gives you the uh, diuretic effect. So again, that's fluid loss um, out through the, the urine. And obviously the uses for a loop diuretic like furosemide, we're going to use that uh, to eliminate fluid and, and fluid excess. So heart failure, um, ascites with cirrhosis, or due to cirrhosis, I I should say, those are, are by and large, the most common indications that you're you're going to see uh, this medication used for um, and just generalized uh, edema in general too. Uh, It is important to look at that patient medication list if you see a new prescription for a drug like furosemide, okay? Because that's indicative of a new problem usually. So if you see a prescription for furosemide, you're going to be managing edema. You're likely not going to use it for blood pressure or anything else. And as a pharmacist, I'm always looking for drug-induced causes of problems. Okay, so that's kind of that prescribing cascade where you have a medication, causes a side effect, um, in this case edema, and then you add another drug to treat that adverse effect. So some common meds to look out for. Um, calcium channel blocker, which uh, there's evidence to say that using furosemide may not really help that much um, with that type of edema um, versus a, a, a medical issue causing the edema. Uh, pregabalin can, can cause some edema and swelling, gabapentin, uh, pioglitazone or, or actose diabetes drug, not used terribly often anymore, um, and NSAIDs. Can, can cause some fluid retention and uh, obviously some, some issues there. And I will touch on NSAIDs with drug interactions as well because there's uh, more to play with, with that medication and the use of furosemide. All right, one thing that I have seen come up, um, I recall there being uh, a recall um, on furosemide several years ago, I believe, or, or a shortage maybe would be a better way to uh, say that. So um, you need to understand, or it can be helpful to know approximate dosing equivalents. So of some of the, the loop diuretics. So this is a, a question I have seen on board exams and things like that too. So dosing equivalencies, um, for, or again, this is just oral, uh, for osamide, 40 milligrams is approximately equivalent to, uh, bumetanide one milligram or bumex, another loop diuretic. And then the approximately equivalent to, um, 20 milligrams of, of torsamide oral. And there is some evidence to say that it, it may be 10 milligrams uh, as well. So that one's a, a little bit controversial. But um, remember, these are approximations. So anytime you switch somebody to a different drug, 
uh, it's always a good idea to reassess that patient clinically. You know, whether that's looking at, you know, urine output, maybe lab work, that type of thing. Uh, so, so critical to pay attention with any conversion that it might not be exact, okay? Uh, adverse effect profile, uh, hypokalemia. Um, uh, symptomatically, you know, obviously if you get severe enough, uh, severely low potassium, you can have, you know, cardiac problems and things like that. So uh, that's obviously a life-threatening type situation. Uh, but generally from, you know, mild hypokalemia, from patients, the most often reported uh, issue that correlates with that it has been like leg cramping and things like that. So if you ever hear of a patient reporting some cramping and stuff, um, electrolytes is definitely one of the things I look at. And then obviously as a pharmacist, uh, thinking about those medications that could lower those electrolytes. So And, and obviously furosemide is notorious for causing hypokalemia. Uh, now, this is an example of the prescribing cascade as well, where we add furosemide for, you know, maybe a heart failure issue. We need it to run fluid off, um, and we also may need to use potassium supplements, and, and that's to get that potassium level up because the furosemide is, is depleting potassium. So, uh, prescribing cascade, it can be a necessary thing. Um, but think about it, if you take away furosemide, let's say the patient's doing better and they, they don't need it or they just needed it for a short period of time, um, go back and look and say, hey, were they on a potassium, we're discontinuing this furosemide, think about it and say, hey, do we really need this potassium supplement still if we're discontinuing the furosemide? So good little kind of trick there to try to reduce uh, medications and, and polypharmacy. Uh, drop in blood pressure can certainly happen with that, that fluid and, and electrolyte loss, uh, hyponatremia. So again, you're going to monitor uh, electrolytes uh, with, with furosemide. And then, of course, loss of, of renal perfusion, dehydration risk. So you're going to monitor kidney function um, and making sure that uh, renal function is not getting worse there. Uh, more rare things that I have seen come up occasionally, but not real common, uh, loops, uh, furosemide is associated with elevated uric acid. Um, typically, we think of the thiazides as, as having it a little bit more. So again, those are those patients with gout. Uh, elevations in uric acid could increase the risk for a, a gout flare. Uh, rash, hypersensitivity reactions, they can happen. Um, ototoxicity and, and nephrotoxicity. I kind of mentioned nephrotoxicity before. Um, this generally, specifically the ototoxicity, hearing loss, is going to happen with higher dosages, IV dosages, uh, and patients that, you know, may have additional, uh, risk factors and, and kind of the classic example, uh, that you may see show up on an exam or something is an aminoglycoside, um, can cause ototoxicity as well. So, and I, I have done a podcast, I believe on aminoglycosides, so you can go, uh, check that out if you want want more info there. Um, bioavailability, I think, is important uh, with furosemide when comparing IV to oral, uh, because if you think about it, you know you've got a heart failure patient. Uh, they've got acute heart failure exacerbation. They need to go to the hospital. Uh, we're going to likely use IV furosemide. So then after we've used IV furosemide, what exactly, you know, do we convert them to? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of clinical reasoning that, that goes into what we're going to convert them to. You know, did they, were they adherent to their medication therapy? Were they not adherent? And that's what put them in the hospital. So you're going to have to figure that out, you know, what, what is the appropriate dose to do. Uh, but as far as a, uh, from a conversion standpoint, uh, there is quite a bit of variability in the literature about truly what is the appropriate conversion. Um, I would say I see a lot of clinicians approximate about 50% uh, of the uh, IV dose, or excuse me, it's approximately 50% uh, bioavailable as an oral medication. So for instance, if you had an IV dose of 20 milligrams a day uh, on furosemide, uh, that would approximately convert to 40 milligrams of furosemide. 
again, not an exact science. You need to look at patients clinically. Uh, you need to closely monitor. And if it's a person discharging from the hospital, hopefully we're doing that uh, so we don't put them right back in the hospital. But uh, that's an, an approximation, and, and it's so critical to, to monitor that urine output, renal function, electrolytes, and all those things that, that go along with any conversion there. All right, so let's take a quick break from our sponsor, and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material, such as BCPS, ambulatory care, geriatrics, MTM, uh, psychiatric certification, go check out meded101.com slash store. We've got a growing list of resources there. Um, I update the, the content, go through and update the content annually um, to make sure that you know, we're up to date with guidelines and things like that. I've also have obviously received feedback uh, from folks over the, you know, five to six plus years we've been been doing this at this point. So, um, yeah, I, I think we've got some really nice resources, really helpful resources um, that, that can help you prepare uh, for those exams. So, again, go check out meded101.com slash store. If you're another healthcare professional looking for, you know, books, education, uh, I've got a book in the works on polypharmacy and the prescribing cascade. So if you work a lot in geriatrics, I'm going to share tons of examples of some of the most common prescribing cascade mistakes that are made. Um, th that link, when it's ready, uh, will be at meded101.com slash store. Again, with all the other books, um, paperback, ebooks, uh, audible books, um, go check all those resources out. Any purchase there is going to uh, help support this podcast. And certainly I greatly uh, appreciate it there. All right. So let's wrap up with drug interactions. Uh, first and, and foremost, I think of, of common drugs. So um, combinations of diuretics, ACEs and NSAIDs or, or ARBs and NSAIDs, uh, they can be really, really taxing on the kidney. So we, we've got to be really cautious and, and careful um, when we're using those drugs together. Uh, in a condition like heart failure, which loops are often found in and ACE inhibitors are often used in as, as best practice, um, you know, we, we've just got to be really, really careful and, and monitor kidney function and uh, that fluid status and and kidney function is kind of a yin yang as far as um, aggressive hydration can reduce fluid or excuse me aggressive uh, diuresis can obviously reduce fluid help heart failure symptoms but if we get overly aggressive we can end up hurting that kidney and certainly uh, those dr other drugs aces aces or arbs and NSAIDs can make that worse so um, in anybody with heart failure you're probably going to try to avoid NSAIDs at all costs. Um, so that's that's something to, to keep in mind. If one absolutely has to be used, um, you know, minimize the dose, minimize the duration, and, and do, do the best we can to protect them, uh, to protect our patients from that risk of uh, increased uh, renal function issues there. Uh, aminoglycosides uh, certainly added nephrotoxicity and, and ototoxicity risk. Uh, SGLT2s, so if you remember, they're, they're kind of classically considered an a anti-diabetes agent, um, but they definitely have some cardiovascular benefits, So, um, which they, they may end up being more of a, a cardiovascular drug versus a, a diabetes agent. But um, anyway, it does have added diuretic effects, so it can drop some blood pressure. Uh, in addition, that lowering blood pressure effect, obviously any medication used to lower blood pressure or used in the management of hypertension um, could have additive effects there. Uh, also, you know, you think of, of maybe non-blood pressure medications. So uh, your PDE5 inhibitors, uh, you know, such as sildenafil, uh, cinnamon, um, alpha blockers, you know, used in, in BPH like tamsulosin. So any drug that, that has that blood pressure lowering potential could obviously have some additive effects. I think of, of, of gout medications, I would say it's not crazy high on my list, but uh, if I notice that allopurinol doses have been increased or that um, uric acid levels have gone up, uh, it might be on account of the uh, loop diuretic or the furosemide 
and kind of counteracting that effect. Uh, and then there has been reports of kind of, you know, maybe a, a slight increase in blood sugars with loop diuretics. Um, so I guess if you see escalating diabetes medication dosages, it could be on, on account of that. But I would say by and large, it's probably not a clinically significant thing uh, to worry about there. So um, there's just a, a good summary of some of the, the more common uh, drug interactions that, that I see with furosemide. Obviously, that doesn't include them all, um, but a, a good overview for you there. So uh, if you enjoyed the, the podcast today, uh, please leave a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, go to reallifepharmacology.com, get that free uh, PDF, kind of an, a no-brainer for you to get there. And uh, if you want to reach out to me, comments, questions, uh, mededucation101 at gmail.com. It's probably the, the best way to track me down. Otherwise, you can find me on LinkedIn, Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCGP, BCPS. So don't hesitate to uh, uh, connect with me there. All right, I'm going to sign off for today. Thanks again for listening and uh, supporting the podcast, of course. Take care. Have a good rest of your day.